Lee Webster is a nationally recognized public speaker on funeral reform, including home funerals and green burial. She has served in major leadership positions of the Green Burial Council, Conservation Burial Alliance, National Home Funeral Alliance, National End of Life Doula Alliance, and is the founder and director of New Hampshire Funeral Resources and Education and co-creator of the Funeral.org Partnership. So I actually have more of your bio that I'm going to put in the chat here so people can read your experience, um, but I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you, Lee. Thank you so much for joining us. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, it's great to see some of the uh, some familiar faces and names out there. So thanks for coming by to hear what you've probably already heard before. Um, but those of you who are here for the first time, uh, please try not to be overwhelmed. There's a lot of information to take in on this topic. Um, and I promise you will have access to all of this information later on the, um, the New Hampshire Funeral Resources website. And I'll be happy to answer questions as we have time. So I'm going to get moving here, sharing my screen so that we can get on with uh, with what I want to tell you. And um, here, trying to get that up there. All right, good. And for some reason, I'm getting your admits. Okay, good enough. Um, all right, uh, so basically what we're all looking for, one of the reasons that we're paying so close attention to what's happening in the news and with other things is that we're trying to find a better way to leave the planet. So um, <clears throat> green burial is one of the ways to do that. But before we can talk about that, we need to talk about why we're all interested in it. And one of the main reasons is that we've come become alert over the last decade or more to uh, what we're doing, uh, what we've been doing for about the last hundred years or so. All of these materials in this list are things that we are, um, it, that we're having to either manufacture, uh, transport, all of those types of things. Um, and of course that has its own footprint, plus uh, you know what it means when we put all these things in the ground. Uh, so so th this is something that we're concerned about having to do with lawn burial itself. Um, I don't know why I am getting your notifications, but okay, there we go. Okay, I see um, them too, so you can just ignore them. Okay, great. Um, so one of the things to pay attention to here specifically uh, is the release of carbon. Uh, we estimate about 250 pounds per person because of the manufacturer of the vault and the, the um, uh, caskets and all of that kind of thing. We're also concerned about herbicide and pesticide runoff. Uh, that's a high phosphorus content. And that's going to matter here too when we take a look at uh, cremation in a moment. But I want to draw your attention also to what this means to the workers who are involved. Uh, we're looking at embalmers and funeral directors having very notable increases in risk to their health um, <clears throat> as a result of working with embalming fluids. Uh, formaldehyde specifically, but other things about their um, about their work uh, that is, aren't even on this list. There's a very high alcoholism uh, rate among funeral directors, as you can imagine. It's a difficult field. Um, lots of other diseases as well, particularly neurological diseases. Uh, Parkinson's disease seems to be the favorite. Um, maintenance and factory workers, we don't have a lot of numbers on but we do have evidence that they are, uh, because of the work that they're doing and all those herbicides and pesticides that they're taking in, we're also looking at respiratory diseases and neurological uh, disorders. And the interesting one is uh, the um, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And that can be attributed to Roundup. You've probably seen a class action suit advertised endlessly on TV for this. This is who they're talking about. We also have issues with uh, crematory operators. Um, more just recently, studies coming out explaining that they are at an increased risk, specifically um, of cancer, because of contamination in the crematory itself. So, lots to be concerned about there. So, while we're talking about cremation, we want to kind of knock all this out. Um, so, you have uh, this is sort of as a baseline before we talk about green burial. Um, the, the, what these gentlemen are doing here is uh, problematic in an awful lot of different ways. What people don't realize is that these are not ashes. These are um, uh, pulverized bone and it's very heavy and dense. And uh, in order to, to, to get to this state, we have to expend a tremendous amount of fossil fuels. 
and, and uh, the process is releasing mercury and all kinds of other things up uh, particulate matter up into the atmosphere and down into our waterways. Um, again, expending about the same amount of carbon as we would in vault burial. Um, that final product that's not ashes is calcium phosphate and sodium. As you can see, 200 to 2,000 times what uh, plants can tolerate, very high pH. It takes about three years for that to neutralize. And that's neutralized. There's nothing nutrient rich about this uh, because of the process of um, incineration all of those nutrients are locked. So they don't go underneath grandma's rose bush unless you wanna kill it. Uh, the other piece of this is if we're putting it out here on fragile alpine flora, uh, then it's gonna rain, go into vernal pools, kill off, uh, al uh, create algae bloom and kill off marine life. If we put it around trees, it girdles the trees and kills the tree. If we put it in the ground, it has the uh, chance if, it, if there's enough of it, to kill microbial and plant communities. Um, so this is, this is not the, um, the, the, the neutral item that we've always thought it was. So while we're talking about cremation, we need to talk about two other forms um, of, uh, of disposition that are starting to, to get people's attention. One is alkaline hydrolysis. Desmond Tutu used this process and the media called it green burial. It's not green burial. It's a cremation process, which means it's a reduction process. Uh, it's also an incomplete process, just like cremation is. We're going to have up to 10 to 15 pounds of that bone left over, and we're going to have all of that water that we needed to use in order to, um, to create the, this, this with the lye solution to, uh, to, to do its job. Um, it's now legal in 26 states. Uh, Vermont just came on, um, but it's only available in 17, which means that um, uh, it, it, these are very expensive units. It's very hard for funeral homes or anyone else to make them, uh, to build them, and they're already paying off their flame crematories. So this is kind of asking too much from a lot of people. Natural organic reduction, the one that's really getting all the attention. Um, I, I was mentioning earlier, uh, a, a colleague of mine, Caitlin Doty, wrote a piece yesterday that made the New York Times, you may have seen. Um, it's got a lot of great persuasive language in it, certainly explaining why we need to be looking for more um, uh, environmentally responsible uh, methods. Um, but this is also a reduction. It's right in the name. Um, this is helpful in urban areas, not so much in rural areas like ours. And you can see why as we go through the list. Um, this takes time, you know, takes up to, to uh, two months to do this. It means that we're having to procure feedstock, it's alfalfa and wood chips and so on. There's an energy um, uh, uh, price tag to that. And there's also the, um, the, the movement of it, getting it brought into the city to the facility. Uh, but this is temperature and humidity controlled. The process does do all of the things that we wanted to do, mitigating um, the different uh, pathogens and pharmaceuticals. Uh, re really good numbers on that, meets all the EPA safety standards. But it, just like the other two processes, when it's done, the bones need to be removed. Uh, any kind of implants are removed and those are recycled, which is really great, same as we do with the other processes. But it leaves uh, at least a minimum of a cubic yard of this material. Um, it is nutrient rich, but it, it, uh, it, it, a cubic yard is a whole lot of material. And then that needs to be trucked out of the city to some place where it's going to be, uh, it's not going to be buried, it will be um, spread. Um, but, but uh, you know, that's, again, lots, lots of other things that we need to be thinking about around this. It's available now in Vermont. Um, you can do it. It's legal. California in another five years. And um, uh, New York, we're waiting for uh, Governor Hochul to uh, sign that bill. I hadn't heard yesterday. She was supposed to have done it yesterday. Maybe, um, maybe that'll happen today. It will make a huge difference in metropolitan areas where uh, particularly in New York during, during uh, COVID, the reason you were seeing all those refrigerated trucks was that there were only four working crematoria in all of the five boroughs. So to have more facilities is really critical in urban areas. Um, another thing I just want to mention really quickly, as we're talking about all of this, we need to be keeping our mind on uh, potential greenwashing. There's a great deal of it out there. 
Um, people are constantly sending me uh, notices about things uh, that uh, they, they haven't thought their way through all of the, uh, the, the pieces that go into making this. Uh, one of them is uh, products like this lovely wicker casket which is fully biodegradable. It's something that we would all want to use. It's lovely, um, it, it works. However, uh, chances are very good it was made in Indonesia and we can't uh, vouch that it wasn't made uh, with child labor. So we wanna be paying attention to the, the uh, uh, transport uh, footprint as well as the way it was made. You've also been hearing, I'm sure about Memorial Forest. Uh, these are places that are offering a place for you to put all those cremated remains around the roots of trees. And um, uh, there isn't always a conservation entity that's overseeing this. It's not, because it's uh, cremation, it doesn't require that the land be a cemetery. So there's no protection there. Um, the, the conservation entities are often ones that they simply build themselves. They're not necessarily entering into a conserva conservation easement with a, a local uh, land trust of any kind. So th there's a lot of things to watch out for that. Lots of alarm bells going off. So keep an eye on that. The price also is, is astronomical when you can, um, you can dispose of cremated remains for free. Um, and the last one that I'm just picturing here, there are many more, there are coffins and there are the, the infinity suit here. And these are, uh, th this is uh, the, the mycelium. Uh, in inoculated clothing. The, the issue is that that lives in about the top six inches of the forest stuff. It doesn't, it's not going to survive at three and a half to four feet, no less five feet. Um, and there has been testing on this and they've abandoned the experiment right in the middle of the test because there was absolutely no my, micro, there was no um, uh, uh, fungal growth occurring uh, in this space. Um, so keep your eye out for these things. They sound lovely, they're very sexy, but they don't necessarily work. Uh, one last thing about this, people are always asking about pricing and um, you can see the prices here. They, they're generally uh, favorable to doing less, right? <laughs> the less you spend, um, you know, it, 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 you're, you're looking at more uh, natural processes. So uh, as you can see, natural organic reduction is sort of, Midway in terms of funerals is sort of midway between a cremation and a full um, conventional vault burial. So keep an eye on the pricing as we go. So on to green burial, this is where we really want to go. Um, one thing that's been really heartening is that um, we, the, Kate's Boylston, which is a, a, a funeral industry magazine um, group, and they've been doing studies and surveys of the public for the last 10 or 12 years. And what we've seen is this really rapid growth in interest. And you can see as of uh, you know a, a year ago, May, 91% of the people that were surveyed said that they're interested in this. And 84.4 said they would choose it if they needed it next week. So um, it's it, it, the growth is huge. People are starting to pay attention. And we have we know that we have at you know close to just this week I updated the list we're close to 370 known green burial cemeteries and I don't know them all so the greater impetus for this is uh, even though I've gone over the negatives about some of the other things what we want to do is shift our thinking to the positives of what natural burial would would uh, would create uh, what we're trying to do is sequester all of these, the carbon, the nitrogen, and so on, not just not spend it or, or emit it. We're looking to find the benefit from our bodies that we can, um, we can contribute and contribute to, to building climate resiliency with what we do with our bodies when we die. So here are the basics. These are pretty simple. Um, we're going to be burying at about three and a half to four feet. That's just above bedrock. That's where all that lovely microbial activity is occurring. We're not using a vault. We don't need one. Um, we'll explain a little more about that later. We're using biodegradable containers. Again, we want ones that um, that are uh, you know have a, a very small footprint. And if possible, this isn't a requirement, but if possible, we would like non-invasive preservation techniques. No embalming. Uh, in, and there are green embalming fluids, 
but again, most people who are going to look for natural burial are, are not going to want to uh, do difficult things to bodies before. So that's kind of how it works. There are different types of cemeteries as well. What you just saw in that other picture was a hybrid cemetery, and that's an, an existing cemetery, one that's usually municipally owned or a religious or ecclesiastical group. And that's the cemetery that's been burying vault with vaults, and they, they're going to allow either burial in between what they've already um, buried with a vault or provide a separate section that's going to bury uh, without any of those things. A natural burial cemetery is exactly that. It's just going, its whole purpose is to bury naturally. And a conservation level cemetery is one that's going to be burying naturally, but on land that's conserved that has a genuine land trust conservation easement or some other type of instrument to protect it. And, um, and that's a partnership within your community. So some of the main things that people ask about, um, uh, uh, always fascinating to me, I wrote a piece a few years ago for the Green Burial Council uh, called, I think, um, 10 uh, answers, uh, real answers to questions real people ask about green burial. One of them is about uh, grave subsidence, meaning caving in. Oh, if you don't have a vault, won't it cave in? No. Uh, will it will it cave in if you step on it and there's no vault? No, <laughs> and, and it, it is going to sink. It's going to settle, and uh, that's it. There's no no worries around that. Um, animal disturbances I get asked about a lot too, and it, that's not an issue here, particularly here in New England. Um, the the animal that can go the deepest in digging for something are wild pigs and we don't have them here although they're on the move uh, north from from southern areas but they don't go further than 12 inches or so they're really not interested in us uh we haven't yet in in all these years this has been going on here since 1997 in the u.s um we haven't had any uh, anyone dug up or moved around they're really interested in live prey so not not interested in us same thing for odors you know where it's, it's just not happening it's three and a half feet down plus the mound that we're gonna put over the top. Um, pharmaceuticals, pathogens, people are worried, you know, if you've had chemo recently, what's gonna happen? Well, it, it's gonna get bound. Uh, soil is the greatest filter and those things uh, bind. We don't really have to worry about it. Metals, if you've got a metal hip implant or something like that, we're gonna leave it in the ground, people first. Um, those aren't leaching anyway, not the way that what we're putting in the ground right now is leaching all over the place for sure. Um, now, the biggest thing is this picture, and that's winter burial, a big concern for us. Well, there are three states in the Midwest that require that cemeteries stay open in the winter. We do it by choice here. Our cemeterians make those decisions because they don't want to bring the heavy equipment in onto the roads, but that's their choice. Um, these guys have been doing this for years and years. Um, you simply heat the ground. There are multiple ways to do this. They're just doing it with a wood fire, creating coals, and then they're going to put a top on this. It's going to thaw down the layer, and then they can dig. It's just not a big deal. Um, many cemeteries in New Hampshire and Vermont do go through the winter, so none of those things are big concerns. Uh, another piece to this is that home burials are legal in New, in New Hampshire and Vermont and uh, al almost everywhere. There are a few states that don't allow it without a special permit, but we can do this uh, if we meet these specific um, setback requirements. In Vermont, there, there are more. I'm sorry, I didn't include them tonight, but you can find them on the vermontfuneral.org website. These are for family members only. You can't just say, I'm going to bury my friends in my yard. Um, but it's a very easy process. You just, just uh, you know, it goes on your deed as a full disclosure because it's a real estate um, thing. If you sell your house, you have to tell people where things are. But the good news is if somebody buys your house and there's a cemetery on it, they now have a bunch of new relatives. So, uh, and they can bury there too. So good to go. You create a public right of way so that people can get from the road to visit at any point in, in, in the future. And it's uh, really pretty easy uh, here in New Hampshire. We have virtually no uh, zoning ordinances other than in the city of Keene that I know of. If you learn more, let me know. Um, so this is really a very doable thing. This is one of my my uh, hospice patients who uh, went through hospice and was uh, had a home funeral and was buried in the backyard of the family uh, farm that had been in their their possession for generations. 
And the, another big piece about this is that we're not just talking about putting bodies in the ground for environmental reasons or price reasons or anything else. We're actually looking at this through a much bigger lens. And that lens has to do with making uh, this uh, affordable uh, so that we are not denying access to people who don't have the means. We're also looking to create physical access to the outdoors something that, um, that is the, a, a major tenet of environmental justice, making sure that people who wouldn't otherwise have access do. Uh, we're trying to do this. We're trying to increase the opportunity for people with um, uh, creating mobility access trails uh, and uh, also making those possible for people with visual or, or hearing impairments to participate fully. Uh, again, we're looking at bringing anyone who can, anyone who's interested on the land, and we are um, we're not just burying people on these properties. We're creating community uh, access events um, here and educational events, even agricultural um, uh, uh, possibilities on these lands. So th there's a greater mission here than just creating a new cemetery that doesn't have vaults. So I just want to walk you through quickly what it feels like um, and looks like sort of from the moment that you arrive at one of these cemeteries. Now, these pictures are a mix of all the three different types that I was talking about. So one that is near you may not meet all of these, um, you know, I may not look exactly like all this, but it's basically, you know, got the same uh, ideas here. So we're burying it to three and a half feet. What we're going to do is lay in a, um, a, a, a bit of biomass in the bottom of the grave. First of all, that's going to cover up any any, you know, it's uncomfortable for some people just looking at, at the ground. And we have a lot of water. We're always going to have water in graves. It's not a big deal. It's what happens. Um, but we also want to put this in. It's great because it provides an oxygen trap and that helps with the decomposition process. Um, and it makes it easier to get the straps in and out uh, for us to lay that person in there. Uh, and as you can see, we can make it beautiful. On the sides of the grave, we're going to put these uh, planks so that, again, that grave subsidence is going to be reduced. We're going to put rails across with straps of any kind. This is this is rope, but we can use all kinds of different straps. And um, that we're going to be then pulling those rails out as we're lowering. Um, and you can see there's a pile of the dirt. We don't take it away. We leave it right there. We cover it up with some greenery that we're going to use later. And we're going to lay in all the shovels there, including children's size shovels so that everybody can get busy when we're done. Um, there is, we're bringing back processions, mainly because a lot of these cemeteries are in places where we can't get vehicles. We don't want vehicles up into them, uh, although some do in a, in a hybrid cemetery. But this is part of the process is that people are physically involved in the carrying uh, of, the, of the dead, um, taking turns often in these processions, they'll stop uh, and actually have started the funeral process already. They'll stop and have music, they'll have a poem, they'll have a reading, uh, uh, share a story, something like that. So it's um, it, once you're in, you're in, you're present, and you're participating. Uh, transporting, it can sometimes be difficult. Not everyone wants to carry, so we have all types of vehicle options that we're bringing in. As you can see, none of them are, uh, we have the the golf cart, which is electric, uh, so we're not bringing any fossil fuels in. Um, ceremony at graveside can be identical to what has uh, normally been done. There's nothing to preclude this. There's nothing to preclude full military honors either. This is very uh, popular among veterans um, for various reasons, but there's no reason for things, anything to be different at graveside. The, the one thing that it will be different is that the pallbearers or uh, participants who choose will probably be the ones who are doing the lowering. Uh, some of these um, cemeteries do use hydraulic lowers, but most of the time it's, it's this is it, this is what we're doing. Once the um, casket or the shrouded uh, body goes into the ground, we're gonna put something over that. Again, those greenery, that greenery that was sitting there, we call that blanketing. And again, that increases that oxygen and um, and humidity level. And um, and at that point, we're ready to fill in the grave. And you can see kids get into this like it's their job. And, uh, and for people who may have originally started out just sort of throwing a little bit of soil in as a, a symbolic gesture, 
begin to recognize that they want to do more and they'll put their backs into it. Uh, there's something very, uh, you know, we don't, we don't tend to recognize in this, this society that grief is not just emotional, it's physical. And this is a, 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 an, just amazingly cathartic for people who do get involved. So when we're finished, we're going to mound up all the soil. We don't take anything away. We're going to mound it up. And then we're going to put, uh, again, more material on top, not just to make it beautiful so it's your last you know, picture of it, but also to hold that soil in place so that uh, you know, if we get a heavy rain or something, we're going to you know, not have that, that mound erode. It just takes a, a couple of weeks for, for that to really settle down. And uh, within a couple of months in some areas, um, it'll be fully overgrown um, with, you, you know, or not fully overgrown, but overgrown enough so that you, you, it's hard to distinguish. So memorialization is another big thing I've heard for, for years. Oh my gosh, you green burial people, you just want to, you know, put bodies in the woods and walk away. And that we couldn't be further from the truth there. We are very concerned about memorialization. Um, what you're seeing on the far left is a, is a GIS tag uh, or a GPS tag, depending on what system they're using, how it's going to work. And this is, um, this is for record keeping. We're trying to get good record keeping because this has been a problem in New England forever and ever. Uh, you know, uh, records in basements that get flooded and moldy and mildewy. So um, this is a terrific new way of doing things. Um, in the middle, you're going to see this, is, this was... Um, um, uh, piloted by Mel Bennett at the Life Forest, which is a uh, cremated remains burial ground only. Um, she and I were out walking the woods here just this morning for conservation burial, full body burial land. So I'll keep you posted on that. But, uh, but it was her idea to, to try this, to set up a QR code, to put it every grave site so that when people came onto the property, they could pull out a smartphone and call up uh, the person that they're there to visit. And so you get music and video and poems and whatever else that might have been uploaded about that. It, it's, it's memorialization on steroids. We still go with the, the um, native stone that we can engrave. Uh, so there's no reason not to have that. We do go with flat markers and we hope to have them made of um, stone that field stone that was uh, present on the property already. Uh, but um, but you can see th this is just the beginning. We're looking at uh, art installations, permanent and temporary. We're looking at building contemplative space, um, uh, that type of thing. So there's there's a lot a uh, lot of ways to do this. So a quick mention about biodegradable containers. There's no reason whatsoever not to uh, use your imagination. Uh, contact your local uh, craftsperson who does woodwork or or a a uh, family member or a neighbor who, who builds something in the garage. Um, you can spend a lot of money. You can spend a little money. As you can see in the Larkspur picture, it's, it's found materials. So uh, anything goes. Shrouds are back. People are paying more attention to shrouds. You can spend a lot of money or you can buy a 100% uh, you know, a, a cotton sheet and still make it very beautiful. What you can see in the middle picture here is that when we use shrouds, we use a shrouding board or we have some kind of a board that's incorporated so that it's stable. Um, if we are, we use that, uh, you know, they're, where they're gonna uh, lift that, they're gonna pull the rails out, we're going to lower, and then we're going to just uh, slightly shimmy that uh, board back out. It's really very easy to do. It's not disturbing. Uh, one of the ways that I've tried to encourage this is by pulling together a whole bunch of um, funerary um, materials makers around the country and Canada. And I just got this website up recently. These are people uh, you can go here and uh, find people in our area who make these materials so that you're shopping locally, you're supporting local artists and craftspeople. And what a lot of them are doing is trying to source their materials locally as well as make them. Our casket makers are growing their own willow, which is not something that necessarily grows here. So they're doing this in a very careful way so that they're um, they're not causing any other kind of environmental issues, but that they're able to um, grow it for their own use. Uh, all of this information and lots more you're gonna find right here on nhfuneral.org. You're also gonna, in Vermont, you'll find it on uh, vermontfuneral.org, uh, very similar information. 
But the reason I want to point you to this is that I have a specific section called the green burial section. Uh, that's where I keep the list, master list for the US and Canada, uh, for all the nonprofit organizations, and uh, do try to keep up to date on, on uh, what funeral, uh, what uh, green burial cemeteries are, are available. And you'll find all kinds of other material there. Under resources, you'll find everything that I've written for all these many organizations. So it's sort of your one-stop shop instead of trying to hunt through um, to find different uh, pieces of information in all these other organizations. Um, another thing that you might want to do is take a look at some of these videos. I've started putting these up on Vimeo, very easy to find. Um, if you were intrigued by cre the cremation ideas and you're still a little unsettled, go take a look at Cremation Curious. It goes into much more depth, explains it um, in detail, and will give you a few more things to think about there. Uh, the underground truth about vaults, you're going to be really surprised. A lot of people don't understand why we have vaults. They think it's about, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I get keeping the body safe, keeping us safe from the body, which was another thing too. Um, but go ahead and watch that. That'll give you an idea of how we really got here. Um, and all these others, uh, what I'm talking to you about today, you're going to find in one form or another, either at the Natural Burial Experience or uh, bringing natural burial to New Hampshire. So go ahead and take a look at those. Um, and there you have it. This is um, this is where you can find me. Uh, and I can point you in lots of different directions to find people around the area who might be able to help you as well. So that is what I have for you. I'm going to stop sharing. How did we do for time? Pretty good. Oh, yeah, we did. Yeah. Really All right. Cool. Pretty good. That's great. Thank you so much. And I'll just say Great. now um, that we are going to, I'll get the resources from you, Lee, and then I'll send an email out to anyone who's registered. So don't, if you missed writing down what Lee had on the screen there, I'll send the website links out and other info so you have access to it after. Does that sound good, yeah. Lee? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so the way we're going to do this, I know some of, some people came in a little late. So I'll just say again, I'm Ginevra and I'm with Sustainable Woodstock. So we're hosting tonight's green drinks. And if you have questions, please put them in our chat box here because we do have quite a few people. So I'm going to ask that everyone type their questions. Um, and if you don't see your chat, it should be around the bottom of the screen when you run your cursor over. And if not, there's a dot, dot, dot more on the far right. And if you click that, chat should be one of your options. So we do have some questions already. Do you want to just dive right in, Lee? And I, I can go sure. through them. Okay. Um, yeah, you, yeah, you've had a chance to look at them. Why don't you go ahead and- <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll ask them. Um, do people have a fear of disease coming from green burial or going into the water system? Yes, people are afraid about that too, which is unfounded. Um, it, we're going to find, uh, again, some in the materials we'll send you, we'll be able to give you some real specifics on why that's not a problem. Um, the, 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 the main thing to know is that you are um, flushing uh, water from your, in your septic system, like astronomically more than one, in one day from what a body is going to uh, leach into the ground over its entire decomposition process. So, um, so this is, this is not a problem. The water doesn't travel long distances. It gets caught up uh, in this whole process. Remember, it's not just water going away. It's soft tissue that's decomposing. It's doing other things. So um, we we do make sure that in these cemeteries that we have um, looked, talked to hydrologists, we've done soil testing. We've, uh, we make sure about that. But, but what you really have to understand is it's the stuff we're putting in the ground with the bodies that's causing any leaching out. It's the metals and, and the uh, chemicals. Now, all that stuff is what's causing what we call cemetery plume. And so what we found we're doing now, we're working on testing here and in the UK to, uh, to quantify the difference between what we already know about cemetery plume in conventional cemeteries and what's been happening now that we have the experience with natural burial. But everything we've got so far tells us we don't have any problems and from a hydrologist and everybody else too. So yeah, it's, it's a fear, but it's an unfounded fear. And I'm, 
this that term is could you just define cemetery plume like what is it exactly because that's new to me yeah it would be the leachate that comes uh, around you know as if, just over time during the during the process um of the uh of the, the life of the cemetery uh if you could look at it um you if you could look at it with sort of a you know superman eyes you would be able to see this sort of circle of contamination around the grave and as i say we know now that that's what causes it it's it's not bodies they they they, they stay pretty pretty much right where they are because those little microbes are going in there and they're doing their work right in place and when they're done the fungi comes in because they're the big eaters they're going to take care of the other stuff it doesn't travel it doesn't go anywhere so thank you um my next question is there a place to find resources to use in estate planning you mentioned a couple resources is there a best one yeah, estate planning. Here's the place to go. Boy, this is this is fabulous. I work with this guy named Brian Hayden, and uh, he started an organization called Redesigning the End. So go to redesigningtheend.com, and you're going to find classes in everything from estate planning to senior housing to green burial and home funerals. And I do stuff. Where I just finished teaching uh, a class, a green burial master class. So they're free, and then there are ones that you can pay for. So pick your way through there. But there's a, a woman who does estate planning the, who is just absolutely wonderful. So go check that out. And the name of that again is? Redesigningtheend.com. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, how long after death can you have open casket if you do not embalm a body? Another way of asking, how quickly does decomposition start and how long after death should you get the body into the ground? Yeah, it all depends on various factors. Uh, what the cause of death was, what kind of shape the person was in when they died. You know, were they on hospice for and hadn't eaten for two weeks or had they just, you know, they die in a, a car accident and, you know, after a five course meal. Um, you know, it all depends on what's in that system. But the general rule is that no matter what, um, for the most part, we can keep someone home uh, in a cooled room and keep them clean in a cooled room uh, for three days. That's generally it. 72 hours is when we go from um, when the, the um, putrefaction process really begins. OK, so that's like the real that's when the body really starts to, to get busy. Um, with the decomposition internally. Um, so three days is usually the max for us. Although in other countries, it's very common to keep people around. If Britain often will keep people around for a couple of weeks before they call the undertaker. Um, other, other, you know, if you read Caitlin Doty's books, you'll find out people will keep their loved ones around for years. <laughs> um, it's very common in, in Tibetan um, culture uh, to, to uh, desiccate the body and keep it. So, don't be afraid of a dead body in the house. Uh, keep it cool. Keep it clean. That's the rule. That's all there is to it. I feel like I have a lot of reading to do. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a general question. Are there laws about what you can and cannot do or what is required? Um, it sounds like the websites would be a place for the law. Yeah, you're going to find a page that says how to learn the law. And you're going to find all the things that the law in that particular state stipulates. Um, and, but for the most part, I have to tell you, it's pretty much a hands-off thing. We have had the right to care for our own dead all along. We just didn't know it. Um, you know, we need to put on our, our ruby slippers and click a little bit. Um, it, it's This is something that is just a fundamental family right to care for our own dead. And as we continue on then to the idea of burying on our own property, that's also been around forever. And here in New England, of course, if you live in an old farmhouse somewhere, like where I grew up, there's a family cemetery on the property. You may not have headstones on it anymore, but guaranteed there's somebody there. Um, so this is not foreign ideas. Uh, it's just that we it's a little more complicated now because we do have laws. Just go check out what they are. They're very simple. They're very easy to follow. There's nothing mystical about any of it. It's very easy to follow. I live in an old farmhouse with a cemetery. Um, so is there a place in Vermont or New Hampshire that does human composting? 
Yeah, it's legal in Vermont. It's not legal in New Hampshire yet. Um, and no, there probably isn't going to be a facility for some time, although I do know some people who are working on getting the facilities going. Again, they're very, very expensive. They're, we're talking a minimum of about a half a million bucks. Um, and again, we don't have any, any real need for it here. Um, I, I, as always, Vermont, I'm a native Vermonter. So, uh, you know, forward thinking Vermonters, uh, always trying to get ahead of the curve. I appreciate that they did this. Um, but you know, we have plenty of green burial space to do it without doing the secondary incomplete process. So um, I think it's going to be a while before somebody pulls that together and where they do it is going to matter too. Um, because it doesn't, again, doesn't make a lot of sense uh, if they put one together in Burlington, which of course is the, you know, is, is the place that makes the most sense. It's the most urban area. Are you going to drive from Brattleboro to Burlington to get your green um, process that you're then going to have to take the material home and do something with. So keep an eye on all that. Um, it, you know, it may happen sooner than I think, but um, it, it, it'll probably take some time. Thank you. Um, this person says, I've read Caitlin Doty's books. Do you have additional recommendations about green burials for the U.S.? So I guess for the United States as a whole. But books... I, I'm just doing that as other books. Um, yeah, it, it, it basically what you're going to find on um, on either of those websites or at the Green Burial Council website, at the Conservation Burial Alliance website, you can look these all up. They're e very easy to find, and they're all I I build all their websites for them, so everything's cross um, you know cross referenced, so you can find them easily. All of them have got uh, endless resource pages including books, articles, videos, podcasts, interviews, everything. So take a look at all of those. Um, and, and, you know, as you noodle around some of these websites, you're going to get a greater feel for what's happening out there and what needs to happen and what your responsibility is in, in doing this. One of the things that uh, I do want to mention just, just briefly, it's related to that, is that we tend to think that we're gonna rely on the funeral industry to do all of these things for us. We need to understand that in at least five states and there are actually more, uh, but particularly five states here in New England where funeral directors are not allowed legally to be involved with cemeteries. They can't own them, they can't operate them. They're not even supposed to be located next to them. It's not up to the funeral industry to create change within the way with the way that we do uh, we manage all this. It's up to us. And one of the beautiful things about Vermont and New Hampshire is that we elect our, our cemetery trustees in our town every year. Well, you can run for office. You can get in. You can change those bylaws that require the vault. It's as simple as that in many cases. If you don't want to run for office, you can get cuddly with, with people that you put into office. All right. It's our job to create change in our own communities first. So um, just to let you know that, don't rely on somebody else to do this for us. That's really fascinating. I had no idea um, <laughs> about funeral directors. Really interesting. Um, have you heard of circumstances where a family doesn't follow through on the decedent's wishes um, regarding green burial? Yeah, or, or anything else. Um, Vermont and New Hampshire are not states that, that require, um, the, uh, it's, they're called preference laws. And we don't have preference laws. We don't have anything on the books that says that if somebody wrote down and had notarized what their, their plans were, they have to be followed through. Some states do. We don't. We don't in Vermont or New Hampshire? or Nope. Um, I'll read this question. I feel like you already answered it, but if you have more to add, um, how long does it take um, take to decompose without any additives to the body? Yeah, I didn't fully answer that before. So that's a good thing. Um, it, it, again, it makes a difference who we're talking about. If we're talking about, uh, you know, an average, you know, 154 pound woman, right? That's the average weight, ladies. If you're over that, don't worry. But if you're, if you're under it, you're way ahead of the curve. Um, but 150 pound person is um, <clears throat> probably going to take about two months for the for the um, uh, soft tissue to decompose, then the bones are left. And that can take up to 20 years. We don't know. 
Um, it, it's hard to know because it all depends on uh, humidity, uh, air, temperatures, uh, both ambient and, and, and in the, the grave space itself at the time of decomposition, et cetera. Um, depends on the soil type, what the drainage looks like. See, there's so many different factors. There's no way to answer this. But for the most part, what we're looking to do is optimize those conditions so that this happens over a very short period of time. And part of the reason we want to do that in the cemeteries is that we do want to be looking at in 100 or 200 or however many years being able to reuse grave space. Um, that's what makes it sustainable. So the big question is, and this is a legal question that everyone is grappling with, is um, if, if that, if, and this is the way it works, by the way, you own the plot in the cemetery, but the cemetery owns the soil. Most people don't know that. If you put a body in the ground, it becomes soil. The cemetery owns the plot now, basically. I mean, you own the right to that space, but you're not here anymore. And you know, so what's gonna happen with that? Can your family come in later and reuse it? Can someone else come in and reuse it? Can they resell the plot? So we're, we, this is a, a mystery we're gonna try and solve so that we can get to the bottom of it and be able to set this up. Make sense? Wow. Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, can you do a green burial in a traditional town graveyard? If the their bylaws say that you can. It's all about changing the bylaws. And again, Tell me. our cemetery trustees, we vote them in every March and then we walk away going, oh, good thing you're doing it, not me. Well, you know what? Start calling up your trustees and telling them what you want. So we all need to go read our bylaws and yes. call them. Um, can you put a body in the ground after an autopsy? Absolutely. Sure. You can even have a home funeral after an autopsy or after a uh, tissue donation, uh, that type of thing. Very, very normal. Um, the main thing you want to do is talk to the medical authorities. If there's a medical examiner who's involved or whoever did the harvesting, um, you want to just tell them we're planning to bring our loved one home for a home funeral and they'll do a much nicer job of sewing every, everything up and helping you make it look better. Thank you. Sure. Um, there are some things coming up around bones. Um, for example, mm -hmm. this question, do bones need to be handled after decomposition as after in cremation? Uh, not if you're in the ground. When we bury you, we're, we're one and done. So that's, it's not an issue with burial. And that's part of the reason the green burial is the, is the optimum, uh, you know, process here is that there, there's nothing in between. If the body goes in the ground, it decomposes, mother nature does its thing and that's it. We're not moving anything. We're not pulling anything out. All those other processes require that the bones be handled differently. Um, this one's also connected to bones. If you do the natural burial, how to get rid of implants, I presume the bones decompose. The bones will decompose over time. We do not remove the implants. Neither do we uh, cut the zippers out of men's trousers if they're buried in them. Um, you know, it, there are purists, like everywhere else, we're on a spectrum here. We're looking at some people who think that, um, that turning the vault over so that the body is in contact with the ground, which is called butter dishing, they think that that's green. Well, it's not because of all of that other stuff I explained about the vault. And then we've got people who are saying, oh, no, no, we're not letting anybody and we're going to take the fillings out of their teeth and we're going to, you know, cut, they aren't going to have any metal and we're, if they got a knee, we got to, what are we going to, no, 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 <laughs> I'm not going to do any of that. Um, as I said earlier, there is no, there's no leaching from this. We're talking about titanium as opposed to the things we're putting in the ground now that rust and, and do all those types of things. So we leave it alone. We're not going to worry about it. If we get to a point where we're reusing grave space, and we dig in and there it is, it will be intact and it can be removed. Otherwise it's not hurting anything. You know, again, people first. Uh, part of the process here is that we're recognizing the, the um, dignity and respect for these people that we're burying and, and for, the, and for the, the soil that we're putting them in. Um, ground disturbance is a, is a concern for anyone who's in conservation, right? We're, we're always worried about um, soil disturbance. So we're trying to disturb the least amount um, at possible. When we're building graves, in fact, we don't build a great big standard grave with a big machine. We get in and we, we measure how much space we need so that we fit the body in. 
there and we disturb the least amounts of soil as possible. So we're not gonna go back in for, for parts, not happening. Thank you. Um, are all funeral directors cooperative in this process or do you have to be careful about choosing a funeral director? Yeah, um, I'm. I let me reframe the question uh, a little bit, if I could. Uh, most funeral directors, I work with a lot of funeral directors um, of, of all ilk. I, I do a lot of uh, teaching in mortuary schools, actually, so I'm meeting lots of the new ones who are coming uh, into the field, as well as the folks who have had generations of, of family doing this work. And for the most part, what I run into is funeral directors being really grateful that somebody's out there doing something that they can't do themselves, but they want to offer this service to their families in a big, big way, but they can't make it happen. So when, um, you know, are they cooperative? This is their business. You know, when people want something, they are going to do everything they can to, um, to serve families. These, these guys don't, you know, men and women don't go into this field to make a killing because they aren't. They're making less than the average third grade teacher. So don't, don't think that this is what the money is about for them. They're available 24 seven and, uh, and they're there to serve families. They're there to help. So, um, you know, are they cooperative? They are our partners. That's lovely. Thank you. Um, if you do a green burial, but don't have enough space at home to bury the compost, where in Vermont can the soil be scattered? Is there any law against tossing it into the woods or in a state park? Okay, yeah, let's pull that one apart. It's not a green burial if you've gone through um, a natural organic reduction, which is what I think your question is about. Uh, and so that cubic yard of material will then need to be disposed of just as you would any other um, you know, reduction process. So let me answer that part. Um, cremated remains and the this this organic material that's left over, this cubic yard that's left over, can be um, scattered or buried anywhere where you've got landowner permission. You know, on your own property for free, on somebody else's property if they say you can. Um, even national parks, state parks, used to allow this kind of thing, but they are cutting back now because of the abuse, people are taking the, this stuff and dumping it like those gentlemen in the picture and putting it in places where it's killing off um, you know, native uh, flora and, um, and causing other, other issues. So, um, and also on tr tribal lands, a lot of people will, it's amazing, people will take this stuff and they'll dump it on tribal lands, on sacred land. Uh, so this is, everybody's cutting back and saying, no, 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 this is, you, you created this, you're gonna have to take care of it yourself. Um, so can you go and put it in the woods? Sure, it's your, your woods, go ahead. Um, certainly up to you to do that. Uh, if it's a state park or national park check, they have regulations and guidelines and forms and all that kind of good stuff. They used to let you just, they didn't want you to, they didn't want to deal with the paperwork, but um, they're, they're, that's changing. Um, thank you. And just to reiterate the natural organic reduction that you made the distinction with, we don't have a facility like that in Vermont, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. And also remember this, that 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 cubic yard may or may not have the cremated, uh, the, the cremulated or, or um, uh, you know, crunched up bone in the material. If it doesn't, then, you know, at least you're adding it to something else. So it's dispersing the, the dangerous part about the calcium phosphate and sodium, but it still is not going to make that with the bones um, all that uh, all that nutritious when you're throwing it out somewhere. So be sure you know the difference. Um, thank you. So this is a general question. What can we do to get more places in Vermont to start doing green burials? What can we do to get more places? Was that, that was your question? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, just what I've been talking about, talking to your cemetery trustees, becoming a cemetery trustee, um, forming a group in your community who's interested in this, uh, you know, having a, a task force that's willing to put together um, 
you know, programs like this in your community so that you're reaching people in your library, uh, in churches and, you know, uh, senior centers. Try to start educating people about all these questions that you've had are the same questions everyone else has. So if we can get them the truth on all of this, it's going to uh, pave the way for us to start to be able to to uh, build separate cemetery, uh, uh, you know, burial spaces if we want to, or make those changes in our community cemetery, uh, uh, municipal cemeteries. Thank you. Um, this is the New York Times article mentioned. So the New York Times article today talks about using composted people to benefit nature, such as spreading the soil to avert erosion. Is there an organization in Vermont that is doing that and who? Yeah, we, we've we pretty much talked about that. I think, um, I don't know that there's an organization. I've been talking to a couple of different people who are interested in funding a facility. If you remember, this isn't, this isn't an organization, this is a business. So as I say, they're building these half million dollar um, or more facilities. They're, um, they're setting up, uh, they're setting up systems for this. People pay money to to um, uh, you know, bring their loved one there. Um, it's a business, so it's not really something that's going to get organized by uh, individuals, unless you're putting it together a bunch of business owners, uh, capital, you know, venture capitalists, or somebody who's got a lot of big money. Um, I don't know of any group like that yet. Thank you. Um, that's what I assumed. So, if you pass in a hospital, are your relatives able to take your body home for a green burial, or are you required to go to a funeral home first? Okay, we are never required to go to a funeral home. Um, this is the thing that people have have missed in the in the fine print all these years. Uh, in both Vermont and New Hampshire, the family, meaning it, it's really next of kin or a designated agent, if if it, it's outside your blood family, you have someone that you want to do this. So this is really important for LGBTQ families where they may not necessarily have the legal means to make decisions about funerals for, for their um, partner. These are the tools that we have now, but that's who's in charge. Funeral direct, they're a business too, okay? Funeral homes are business like any other business. Um, the fascinating thing to me is that they, we do have states, we have a, a few states in the U.S. that uh, where the government forces people to hire a funeral director uh, to, to do something that the rest of us can do uh, for free uh, by ourselves and caring for our own dead. Um, that, that's interesting. Here in Vermont and New Hampshire, we have no problem taking care of our loved one from the moment they die all the way through disposition if we're going to bury them at home. Um, we do run into a snag because if you want to cremate, the crematories here uh, have their own policies. Remember, they're businesses too. And uh, they have policies that will say that they won't accept a body from a family, only from a funeral director, which then, again, forces us to hire someone to do something that we could easily do ourselves. Um, so that, that's where the rub is. Same thing with hospitals. Uh, often hospitals will have uh, policies they, they put in place where they require a funeral director to do pickup, which makes no sense whatsoever because the law says we could pick them up ourselves, right? Um, and, and we do. So one of the, one of the, another one of those advocacy projects along with your cemetery trustees is to go to your local hospital and say, hey, what's your policy for body removal? And they'll hand you their policy. And if it says that a funeral director has to be present, you need to point out to them that the law says that families can do that. Um, and they will probably change their policy. I've done it several times now. You know, and they only make these policies because they don't know better because they believe that um, the funeral directors are in charge. Funeral directors have no medical or legal authority. Um, you know, I, and they have legal authority only because we give it to them. So that's a really important uh, thing for us to know. We have more power and control over this. In fact, custody and control, that's the letter of the law. Um, and if we exercise it, I think we're going to find a big shift in the way that we view uh, death and how we manage it. Thank you so much. I, it is past 630, but I have one more question that I was hoping I could ask. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. um, this is from a town cemetery commissioner. If a family wants to do a green burial in a town cemetery, is it preferable to sell them an already designated plot? And if so, what size plot? or to establish a separate green burial area. 
In which case, are there specific requirements for soil characteristics? That is up to the cemetery to make that decision, whether they're going to offer burials within existing uh, burials already, vault burials, or whether they're going to set aside an area of their cemetery where they're going to bury green entirely. So that that's something, and, and I do a lot of work with cemetery trustees. We go in and we look at those bylaws and we figure out what suits that community the best. So um, so that's sort of, you know, we have to go with with what works best, not, not a general rule. Um, but your separate question here is about the soil characteristics, and we have all kinds of fabulous data about that. Um, the only thing we really can't bury in is clay. And unfortunately, of course, we got a lot of that um, in, in Vermont, not so much over here in, in New Hampshire now. But, um, but I can share all of those characteristics and where to go to learn all about all that stuff very easily. Um, so I'm happy to, to hear from cemetery trustees who want to tackle this. Nope. Oh, that's my fault. Um, <laughs> uh, classic Zoom move. Um, thank you very, very much for answering that. And um, we have lots of thank yous for you in the chat for this information. Um, people say that they're sold on Green Burial now. So I know you're trying to sell it, um, but you did a great job. So thank you so much for presenting for us. I think for I've sure. learned that. Um, and yes, I will be sending out the recording um, in response to the question here for people who came in late. So thank you so much, Lee. Um, this was really educational. Absolutely. Thank all of you for coming. And uh, I mean, I can't stress enough, get 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 onto the website and do a little bit of homework. I'm always happy to answer more questions. Um, but I'm seeing, I saw other questions there. They're all right there on the website. I'm happy to, to, to move you toward those. So thanks okay. so much, everybody. Thank you. Good night. All right. Bye-bye.